Hello, dear wanderer. Relax, put down your things. That weapon will do you no good here. Allow me to bid you welcome to the halls of the Wanderer's Library. Around you, you will find that the towering shelves are stocked with every book that has been written, will be written, and many that ever will. Don't worry about the startling appearances of some of the other patrons. They respect the rules of the library, as I expect you to. Ah, where are my manners? I am the Round Repeat, eighth chief archivist of the Wanderer's Library. It is my duty to maintain and curate the vastest collection of knowledge in the cosmos. The librarians you may have seen, from the many-legged pages to the mouthless docents, work with me to ensure the library's rules are upheld and the collection remains intact. Don't be off by my appearances. I assure you, the manuals are purely for show. But you look to be quite tired, human. Entering the ways for the first time can take a lot out of you, little bipeds that you are. Rest assured, the library has extensive accommodations for those of our patrons who elect to live in our little infinity outside of reality proper. Housing, food, drink, you will be cared for here, for as long as you choose to remain in the stacks. Careful venturing deeper into the library, though. There are places not even I can guarantee your safety. Violence is forbidden inside the library, but there are worse fates than injury or death to be found here. But, as I said, so long as you remain in this central section, you will most likely be fine. Come, grab a hold of one of my abdomens. I will take you to a calm spot where I used to rest once. High above the shelves, overlooking everything from the sea of words to the main desk, you can sleep there for as long as you wish. It is a bit far, though. Allow me to entertain you with some stories as you fade to sleep. Section 1. Identifying, Hunting, and Betraying Dragons By Inactual Crow Unlike some of the other beasts I have encountered, almost everyone has heard about dragons. However, their rarity and eccentricities have left dragons horribly mischaracterized. The most egregious of these, in my mind, is the idea that dragons want to hoard gold. This is ridiculous. While dragons have been seen sleeping on piles of wealth, this is merely a consequence of their true pursuit, followers. Where there is sentience, there is a dragon trying to amass followers. With followers comes food, water, and any other amenity the highly intelligent reptile may desire. In return, dragons are often more than capable of providing protection or assistance when hunting. To this end, dragons develop advanced telepathic abilities as they age, allowing them to easily communicate with all forms of life. Another misconception is that dragons refers to a single species. Dragons are, in fact, a small and elusive family of animals. As such, one should learn to recognize what a dragon is before the dragon recognizes them as food. Anatomy Dragons are large, scaled, usually quadrupedal reptiles. The aforementioned scales of adult dragons are incredibly tough. Attempting to pierce them is a fool's errand. The scales on the underbelly are thinner, but be sure to avoid using knives and short bows regardless. Most men do not get a second chance to stab a dragon. In rare cases, one may get a chance to attack a dragon in flight. While the skin of a dragon's wing is tough, it is significantly easier to puncture than the scales. Causing a dragon to crash to the earth is by far the safest way to slay them. I would highly recommend utilizing this method whenever possible. Dragons are most vulnerable in their eyes and inside their mouths. An excellent bowman may be able to strike these from range, but dragons provide the less martially inclined of us an alternative. Become one of the dragon's followers. If one spends enough time serving a dragon, it will inevitably give them a chance to strike. Dragons are acutely aware of this, and may attempt to use a suspected traitor for a short time before eating them. This creates a social dance where the dragon attempts to exploit the traitor as long as it can, while the traitor attempts to get close enough to slay the dragon. Each side bluffs their weakness and naive, hiding daggers behind smiles and kind words. The dragon may try appear less threatening by telepathically sounding like a young child or soft-spoken woman. In rare cases, it will try to confuse the traitor by mimicking the traitor's own voice. 
I have performed this dance once. Although I came out victorious, I would dissuade readers from attempting it. Dragons will suspect that any highly intelligent creature is a traitor, doubly so for humans. However, the human knack for treason also makes human followers somewhat of a trophy to dragons. After all, what better testament to one's ability to rule than to have a human as a loyal servant, regardless of whether you are human or not, subtly leveraging a dragon's pride is the easiest way to join its court. Unlike other reptiles, their ability to produce fire has made them warm-blooded. While cold-blooded reptiles are weak and sluggish in the cold, dragons remain as dangerous as ever. Do not let this catch you by surprise. Genera of Note While the information provided above is applicable to just about all dragons, the specific qualities of most genera of dragon will also shape how you interact with them. Examples have been listed below. Drake. Ask a person to picture a dragon, and they will most likely think of a drake. Growing over 20 feet long, drakes are one of the largest species of dragon. Their fire-spewing abilities are the muse of legends and likely the origin of the belief that all dragons are adept fire-breathers. In reality, all other genera of dragons are only able to scorch creatures within biting distance and light bonfires for their followers. Brooding Dragon Growing up to around 18 feet, brooding dragons are the only genus of dragon known to raise their young. Legend says that the scent of a brood pup can make a man drop dead. The reality is that if you are close enough to smell a brood pup, then you are about to learn where the brood mother is. Brood mothers will often amass huge followings, which are divided amongst their young once they come of age. Whelp At only 6 feet long, Whelps have resorted to scavenging and omnivorous foraging instead of going after big kills. As a defense mechanism, juvenile and adult whelps take on the appearance of brood pups. Their only consistent distinguisher from the aforementioned pups is their omnivorous diet and superior telepathic abilities. Whelps often have scavenging birds as followers. The bird finds the carcass and the whelp protects it as they eat. Whelp pups hide in burrows and often prey on insects. River Dragon A distant cousin of whelps, river dragons have adapted their wings and feet to be used as fins and flippers, respectively. At only 5 feet long and with no ability to spit fire, river dragons often kill their prey by drowning them. To this end, they are known to make followers out of any scavenger that will chase prey into the water. Flies, gnats, and ant colonies are common allies. Noble Dragon more commonly found in areas where the gravity or atmosphere does not allow creatures to grow to large sizes, noble dragons, sometimes called swarm whelps or parliament dragons, often do not exceed two feet. To make up for their small size, multiple dragons will collaboratively rule over a group of followers. Their name originates from this tendency to create a dragon aristocracy. Wyvern, only spotted on windy mountainsides, not much is known about wyverns. Best estimates say that they grow to something between 9 to 15 feet. They are known to kill prey by lifting them off the ground and dropping them down the mountain slopes. Wedded Amphitheer At around 10 feet long, wedded amphitheers are notable for never having more than a single follower. In rare cases, this has led to people acquiring wedded amphitheers as a strange sort of pet. A wedded amphitheer with no followers is often referred to as a widowed amphitheer, regardless of whether their follower has died or not. Caped Dragon Found in the most frigid climates, caped dragons grow to around 8 feet long and almost exclusively hunt larger animals. They have a single, knife-like claw on each front foot, which they use to skin their kills. Their name comes from their tendency to wear the pelt of their kills for warmth. While some of these dragons are more formidable than others, it should be clear that the best course of action when encountering a dragon is to avoid it instead of confronting it. Doing so is not cowardly, it is just sensible. That being said, there is one dragon which should be slain if possible. Perhaps against my better judgment, I have included it below. Bookworm, the most elusive kind of dragon. I am the only person to have ever seen a bookworm. 
long and serpent-like, it is unknown how the bookworm manages to fly. Its scales shimmer and shift the light, making the bookworm nearly invisible and its true length indeterminable. I alone have seen it stealing books of the shelves of the library and never returning them. Many would say that this is impossible, that the nature of the library means that books can never truly be removed from it, but I have seen it. I have been ridiculed, my name sullied and my title stripped, as I searched for the creature that is sapping the library's knowledge. They say you do not exist, bookworm. One day, I will show them your severed head. Non-Existence Therapy by Land 2D The Grand Archivist closed his eyes and breathed. It was his first public speaking event for over a year. The hypothetical curtains were drawn and the spotlight was on him. As a creature whose time was mostly split between reading and sorting, you'd think speaking in front of an audience wouldn't be on his list of fortes. And you'd be wrong. Many a wanderer had underestimated the charm of the round repeat, yet he could never understand why. Perhaps it was his complexion. His eyes opened, flitting across the now crowded seminar hall. The room was steadily filling up with members of the library. Some he recognized, some he didn't. Probably more that he couldn't see at all. Standing center stage, the round repeat had a full view of the room and its occupants. Pages busied themselves with their duties, moving aside to allow others to pass. Chairs were lined up in concentric rows, expanding outwards from the curved stage. Volunteer stewards greeted people at each door before ferrying them to their seats. It was a truly wonderful sight. The derelict and unused hall he'd come across years prior was just a distant memory. After taking in the scenery, the Grand Archivist readied himself to begin. He positioned himself behind the podium and cleared his throat. The audience, now settled, turned their attention towards the front. Hello to all. I am glad to be presenting the library's third official educational seminar. This time we are working in collaboration with the Incorporeal Entities Association. We couldn't have done this without them, so please give them a hand. The audience offered polite applause before allowing the host to continue. Our subject for today covers the difficulties surrounding incorporeality, some methods of dealing with them, and some insight on how they might arise. As our guest speakers will explain further, the library has a long history with the incorporeal. One of my predecessors, the second chief archivist, was suspected to be partially incorporeal, yet at the time, immaterial would have been a more common description. The flexibility of the modern term is a testament to our newfound understanding of the different realms of existence. Our language is no longer purely limited to what is physical and what is not. Despite this, many of you may in fact lack a physical body which, as I'm sure you've noticed, is the reason for the unoccupied seats. That, or the seminar, is not as popular as I had hoped. He positioned the microphone closer to his face. The hall's amplification runes made use of one unnecessary, but he still liked to wield it for effect. Now, for those in vacant seats, you may be wondering how you can hear me. To that, I present Malais. To that, I present the lovely Malais, who will be transmitting or perhaps translating, all dialogue throughout the seminar. A grumble came from across the psychosphere. Lovely? Didn't expect that. Lovely indeed. The Technicolor Octopede made a motion resembling a sigh. To conclude the introduction, I would like to bring on our first guest speaker. With his front forearms, the round repeat gestured in the direction of nothing in particular. Please welcome, brilliant, the excellent, and the currently invisible, Professor Alana Yazar. At this cue, the professor presumably made her way towards the center stage. The centipede-like host handed the microphone to what appeared to be thin air, then moved to the side of the room and folded his front eight arms. After a moment, a clear, crisp voice emanated from the stage. Before I begin, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Grand Archivist and his colleagues, all of whom were very welcoming to both me and the association. I see many of familiar faces within the audience today, but to those who don't know me, my name is Alan A. Yazar. I am a doctor of spectrology, a subject which I have written on extensively. You can find my works in the library, I'm sure. 
The microphone, which had been hovering around the stage for the last minute, made a sweeping gesture to the surrounding bookshelves. All eyes were on the empty podium. Yes, I am aware of the fact that I am invisible. Invisible to most, that is. Worry not, this is part of my condition, conveniently leading us to our first topic of the day. The microphone paced across the stage. In some societies, the incorporeal is seen as a mysterious realm, often only accessed through death. Of course, each world connected to the library will have distinct cultures surrounding the incorporeal, which in turn will contain unique planetary cultures and so on. And yet, throughout the ways, physical creatures have shown time and time again to be the dominant sort, with non-physical creatures being sidelined, or more commonly, unknown. Is this to say that it is natural? Perhaps, but it does mean that our understanding of the incorporeal is less than it should be. And so, we come to what I hope to shed light on. How can I, as an incorporeal being, live properly? How can we, as a non-physical community, ever integrate ourselves within a physical world? And most importantly, we must ask ourselves the question, is it even worth the effort? The audience was fully engaged at this point. It was a masterful introduction. The Grand Archivist was almost jealous. I will answer the first two questions in due time, but the answer to the third is clear. Yes. Yes, it is worth the effort. We could easily live in two worlds, the incorporeal barely interacting with the physical, and the physical suspecting they have ghosts in their house, but here in the library, we are welcomed and embraced. I believe the same thing can be achieved for all universes. The microphone continued moving around the stage, waving itself around. However, like all things, it is easier said than done. In a place filled with magic, that has its own immutable laws and guardians, of course we are welcomed, because everyone is. It is not a simple task to do the same for worlds that are potentially hostile to the incorporeal. So, we must first establish our methodology. What are the most effective and widespread changes we can implement? Is the problem physical or cultural? Once we have done so, we can start to... The microphone suddenly fell to the floor, followed by a gasp from the audience. So sorry, I'll get that. The seminar continued as such, passing beyond the original two-hour limit they had originally planned for. After Professor Yazar concluded her part, a blue spectral entity spoke about its personal experiences, followed by a floating archivist who outlined their plan to help incorporeal entities within the library. Now, the hall was clearing out, pages carrying chairs and picking up seminar programs. Malais had left as soon as possible, but Round Repeat stayed behind, answering questions and making pleasant conversation. No, I don't have infinite arms. Most of them are legs. Finish your question about wraiths. That's much more interesting. He felt a tap on the back. Assuming it was a page, he politely excused himself and swiveled, but found nothing. Ah, Professor Yazar, I didn't realize you were still here. There was a slight pause. Perhaps there truly was no one there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to ask if you were busy after this. She paused. Also, call me Alane. I'm only a professor up on that stage. Oh, don't worry about it. The round repeat rubbed his chin with his two front hands. I have some things to be done, but nothing I can't delay. What's on your mind? I need to discuss something personal. Something I need the library's assistance for. In private, I presume? Well, reasonable privacy would be appreciated. A smile formed on his face. That is, as much as an arthropod can smile. I know just the place. The Armos stood against the backdrop of endless shelves. Its style was defiant, hideous to most. But the Grand Archivist had a certain respect for the black and red color scheme it flaunted so confidently. Among the tired library green and gold, which most establishments adopted upon opening there, anything else was a refreshing sight. The colors felt familiar to him. If he ever grew bored when designing a new wing, maybe he'd try something similar. Table for two, please. Appropriately, the waiter wore a black suit with a red bow tie. Of course, are you waiting for someone? You could say that. 
The waiter escorted them both to their seats. Staring in awe, the chair opposite Rounder Pete pulled itself out. One pincered head tilt later, and he had shuffled off to another table. That happened often? Not as much as you'd think. I tend not to eat if I can help it. Yet you can. Curious. It's complicated, she explained. I said so in the talk, but the variety of incorporeal creatures is as large as physical ones. We have specters, many of whom can't eat or choose not to. Spirits often feel hunger, but can only consume certain enchanted foods. I would go on, but I can't think of any other beings beginning with SP. Spook? He offered. Maybe. Never met one myself. I might have. Difficult to tell when most are invisible. Alani laughed. It does have its advantages, at least for me, considering my unique situation. It's not a choice, is it? I don't know if it's a choice, but it's easier than the alternative. My true form is actually quite visible. Some would argue too visible. True form. Rounder Pete pondered for a second. An interesting concept. Usually when I encounter that kind of language, I'm defending the library from an insane magician or researching an ancient god. Don't read too much into it. However, now that I think about it, my true form looks awfully similar to a centipede. The Grand Archivist leaned forward, suddenly intrigued. Really? No, not really. Alan laughed again. Malice was right. Give you a mystery and you'll devour it instantly. His first two arms formed a shrug. Curiosity is the quality that got me promoted. I think gullibility is more fitting. As she was talking, he waved down the waiter from earlier, who proceeded to stare at the talking chair once more. Ah, uh, yes, I like the... Um... The menu rustled as she spoke. I'd like to order the Celtic dragon for my friend here. The same for me, please. That's everything. The waiter walked off with their menus, shaking his head. Alan resumed the conversation. You didn't have to order the same thing just to be polite. Quite the opposite. I've been here so many times now, I thought it'd be interesting to experience it with a fresh pair of eyes. You don't know I have just two eyes. Touché. There was a natural pause, after which Round Repeat spoke. To abruptly change the subject, I'd like to talk about what you need the library for, if you don't mind. No worries, I'm used to ham-fisted segues, I work with ghosts. The archivist looked expectantly at the space above the chair. It's hard to explain. I wish I could show you, but I'm afraid you'd get a headache. Alan audibly breathed in. First, I must admit I am not invisible, but you already know that. Secondly, I am not incorporeal either, not in the traditional sense. Go on. The most accurate description is an apparition, or a projection. My true form, as it were, is not natural to this world. I wasn't born, I was imagined, dreamed up by a being in a universe I have never visited. For what reason? I am not entirely sure. My body is dynamic. It shifts and changes shape, color, and characteristics. It's not a pleasant sight. I suspect I am something more akin to an idea, a concept, than an incorporeal existence. She breathed in again. And thus, I am inexplicably linked to a being I know nothing about. All I know is that they have an idea of an educated woman which somehow creates my pseudo-physical body. That is extremely interesting. I know of cases where ideas have had physical embodiments, but those are all a one-time deal. Usually they are summoned by a magician, or happen on their own, and once they are created, they aren't connected to the original summoner. As you said, they are born. Yes, exactly. My existence is dependent on the mind of another. I can only learn about them through researching myself. It's what led me to the IEA in the first place, hoping for some guidance on my condition, but alas. Her voice tapered off. If she had been visible, Round Repeat would have seen her solemn expression. And now you guide others. I know the feeling to complete oneself with charity. A sigh came from his opposite. Which leads us to the problem. I have been able to live fairly well in this body, but I can 
I can feel the blink fading. Being a scholar, I fear the worst. I may know of a method. The round repeat puts his hands together in thought. The link, is it more of a physical feeling or an innate knowledge? It's a bit of both. Hmm, spiritual transfusion is not my specialty, but I think I can help you. Spiritual transfusion? What, what does that involve? I'd have to consult with Malai's. He has more experience with that stuff. I'd like to warn you though, he is quite abrasive. I met him before the seminar. He was rather lovely. The round repeat muttered to himself, lovely indeed. They ironed out the details, finally settling on a meeting the following week. Al and I gave herself a few months at most before she expected to fade away. They had time, but efficiency was key. After an exceedingly long wait, the waiter once again came up to the table. The archivist was surprised he was willing to come back at all. He decided he'd tip extra. Your food, sir? Roundbeat held eye contact and the waiter got the message. Tearing his eyes away from the archivist, he attempted to smile at Alan. Apologies, your food is here, sir. He paused. And madam. Thank you very much. A true professional. The seminar hall looked strikingly different without the crowds of people. With the chairs now missing, the mosaic tiling was visible. Concentric circles patterned the floor like the ripple of a water droplet, and in between the rings, countless symbols had been inscribed. The atmosphere had changed too, going from crowded and cramped to spacious and serene. Alan stood beside the round repeat, chatting with him as his octopus associate arranged the ritual. This place has an especially interesting history. You know, when I came into my current position, it was an utter disarray. Is that so? It's so beautiful, I couldn't imagine it like that. Unfortunately, it's not the only place in the library that has needed repairs. The library works by its own rules, and we trust it to do so, but some of these special purpose rooms have been neglected. She noticed a weight to his words, as if he had seen the library in a state he didn't like to remember. He has. As much as we bicker, we were both there. Melissa's is right. We spent years fixing this place up, and the work is far from over. The round repeat said, shaking his bug-like head. But stop prying, you maleficent mollusk. Her mind already has enough interference as is. Fine. Her thoughts were exceptionally loud. Then keep it to yourself. The round repeat apologized for both of them and continued his lecture. After its reconstruction, there was large debate on what we should call the place. One name we were throwing around was the Grand Hall, but we decided against it. Too similar to the main hall. Exactly. Round repeat looked over at Malice. We eventually chose its official name, the Basilica Arcana, meaning the secret or mystical hall, but apparently it was too pretentious since people only call it the Seminar Hall. I can see why people use the simpler one. But the name was perfect, the round repeat exclaimed, lifting his frontmost arms in the air. I thought people would connect with it, how Basilica has the same roots as Basilis, the Serpent King, how Arcana is related to the Arcane and magical. It was so perfect, I'm still upset about it. For once, I agree with you. Alas, it was too clever for its own good. Alana watched the two archivists in awe. The centipedal archivist was pacing the floor, whilst the octopedal archivist made the final preparations. Both were heavily engaged in the conversation. And don't get me started on the new wing we opened recently. I swear, sometimes it feels like the library is working against me. Maybe the serpent is jealous of your constant slithering. Or they can't stand the complaining. The round repeat stopped pacing and folded his arms. Call it what you will, pointing out the flaws and things is the only way to improve. Perhaps, but that doesn't stop it from being annoying. Suddenly, a laugh echoed across the room. Are you two always like this? Like what? They said simultaneously. Watching you two is the most fun I've had all week, but I don't have much time left. Really. I know, sorry, sorry about that. The Grand Archivist glared at Malice. Can we just start already? Alane spoke up. I mean, it looks like he's been done for a while. The Round Repeat blinked. But he... No, she's right. Let's get to it. With a sigh, they both turned towards the yellowish librarian and listened to what he had to say. 
After his explanation was complete, Melissa set the candles alight and stepped into position outside the circle. On the tiles below, the runes were lighting up one by one as the room emerged into a vibrant orange glow. Alanae stood in the center of a triangle, which was itself inside another larger triangle. The archivist stood on two corners of the larger shape, their eyes closed. Her own eyes were wide open. Malias hadn't specified what she should do. A moment later, she felt a voice within her mind. Please remove the bracelet. How do you know about that? There was a pause, but the archivist didn't answer. Hesitantly, she looked down at her wrist as she slid the charmed bracelet off. One moment she saw the floor, and the next her arm was in full focus. The room erupted into a raging cacophony of color. Her form was unveiled, a glowing, vibrating flame of energy barely in the shape of a woman, yet it was clearly her. The embodiment of an idea without concrete edges, a dream given life, she was sculpted from pure imagination alone, and even through their eyelids, the archivists could see her outline. In the light, a solitary object floated towards her. Take the stone. She reached out to grab it. It was warm to the touch, a stone the size of her palm engraved with a sigil she didn't recognize. Now place it down and complete the trinity. Compelled, Alanae put the stone at her feet and took her place as the third corner of the triangle. A moment passed and a foreign voice filled the room. It boomed as it spoke. What is it that you are searching for? I wish to sever the link. This cannot be done. You must provide a sufficient substitute. And I have provided such. A pause before the room was engulfed in their voice once more. The substitute is sufficient. It will be done. As soon as the sentence ended, all the light in the room started to bend around the stone which started to levitate. It slowly rose, casting shadows on the far bookshelves. It was too bright, she shut her eyes. In her mind, she felt the archivist once again. Focus on the link, the sensation leaving your body. Alanae concentrated on the feeling. She imagined a white light being pulled away from her, towards the stone. Everything she was, her whole existence, focused to one point. The sensation flowed through her, and her through it. The stone continued rising, now a maelstrom of color and power. The innate feeling she had lived her life with left her body and permeated itself throughout the room. Like a star, the stone absorbed and emitted, it was an almost perfect harmony. Alanae was so close to her goal, the ritual nearly complete. For a moment, a singular doubt appeared. If the link was gone, surely she would cease to exist? She would be forgotten as easily as a dream upon waking. Alanae heard the archivist's groans of exertion from either side of her. She couldn't match their determination. At once, the light dimmed and the stone fell, but it did not reach the ground. Even if the earth disappears, the bird can still fly, concentrate, the ritual can still be completed. The bird will need to land one day. What then? Do I simply die? No. You exist in the minds of others. You exist in your own mind. It will create its ground. You must forget what you once relied upon and let go of it. You must fly. He was right. It was her choice, her existence. If she truly was an idea, the thoughts of herself and others could will herself into being. Alanae imagined who she truly wanted to be, and she flew. And the stone flew, up towards the epicenter of the room. It flashed and it pulsed in neon lights, creating a supernova of energy. Spinning faster and faster, all the light in the room was absorbed into it, and for a second it was still. Then it fell to the ground, leaving nothing but a clatter on the tiled floor. It is done. Alanae opened her eyes to see the archivists, at the same time slipping on her bracelet out of habit. They were noticeably exhausted, but thankfully appeared relieved all the same. The candles had been blown out, and since the stone lay inert on the floor, the room was dim. With a wave of the tentacle, Malais turned on all the hall's lights. They all took a second to breathe. The round repeat was the first to speak. Come on, let's clean up. She was too tired to object, so she nodded her head and got to work. Over the next ten minutes, the candles were dealt with, as well as the wax on the floor, and the stone was picked up by round repeat and promptly pocketed. Surprisingly, all this was done in silence, no arguments to be found. It seemed everyone needed to clear their heads. 
Al and I broke the silence. Are rituals always this tiring? The two archivists replied immediately. Not always. Yes. They looked at each other. I've spoken enough today, you answer. Hmm, okay. During the ritual, the round repeat had gone deep orange, his shell only now fading back to his signature brownish red. The exhaustiveness of a ritual usually depends on two things. Firstly, the difficulty of the ritual or goal you want to achieve. Secondly, the power and more importantly, technique of the person performing the ritual. This ritual was tiring for both of those reasons. I understand I'm inexperienced and the nature of my situation is mysterious, to say the least. Just, it could have been a lot easier if I didn't hesitate. He gave her a look. It's natural for your first time. He didn't say so, but Malai's fully expected us to need another try. Rightly so. She almost let the stone fall, but she didn't, and that's what matters. Without my intervention, she wouldn't have passed. But it is true. He turned to face Alanae. You did do well for your first time. Thank you. She stopped as if forgetting something. How do we know it worked? Was that the entity you spoke to? My entity? No, it was not. Then what was it? The octopede side. It was merely a projection of my intent. When manipulating esophysical entities, it is wise to use a projection to interact. And what about the stone? It's a simple spell to execute. However, in your case, it required substantial power. Unlike your entity, my projection took intense concentration from both me and Round Repeat to manifest, even for a few seconds. I had to be cautious. Your entity is powerful enough to manifest a full person subconsciously. I imagine they would not appreciate this link being broken, so instead, we provided a sufficient substitute. Alanae nodded slowly, which was the stone. Glad you caught on so quickly. Now please, stop questioning me. Perhaps you can ask the Grand Archivist to set up a seminar on the difficulties of a spiritual transfusion or something. Round repeat nodded. That can be arranged. The telepath started towards the exit then turned. And to answer your other question, I don't know. There is no way of knowing if the ritual worked until the link is severed. We merely moved the end of the link onto something else. We cannot know how much of a connection to you the being still has. I see. Thank you for your help. I mean that. Malice nodded once in her direction, then once at round repeat. I'm off now. If you need anything, you know where to find me. They watched as he left the room. I see what you mean by abrasive, but I'd still argue for lovely. To his credit, rituals are tough. No wonder he never wants to work. A pause. What happens now? I think we simply wait. The Grand Archivist moved towards her, clasping the stone in one of his many hands. Here, this is yours. What do I do with it? The sigil now represents the link that was once between you and the entity. It represents the sensation, that innate feeling which you described to me. If you look, you can see the stone is inert, but the weaker that link, the brighter it will glow. The sensation, now called to her attention, was no longer there. That feeling of being pulled and pushed by another, gone, and all it took was a simple ritual. She felt free. I feel free? As you should. Your existence is now your own. Before this ritual, I felt a building up, like something was about to happen. I told you already, it felt as if I only had a few months left. What if the ritual only removed the feeling and not the link? I assume I'll find out sooner than I'd like. He pondered for a moment. I was wrong. We don't just simply wait. We can also hope. Yeah, she nodded her head in agreement. I'm hopeful too. It was holiday season in the Wanderer's Library. Pages scuttled around providing warm drinks to all. Members of the library congregated in the main hall where they chatted about their latest literary adventures. As always, Malaise protested, but everyone could tell he secretly enjoyed it, and the Planasthi watched it all play out, ready for the next holiday scandal. Deep below the stacks, the round repeat slumbered. The Grand Archivist was completely shattered. Over the past few weeks, he had been running around the library almost non-stop, directing pages, chasing overdue books, and performing other, more festive duties. 
His nest hadn't seen a proper cleanup in almost a month, but that could wait. He was exhausted. Curling up on a mountain of books, the round repeats eyes closed. Finally, he could... A cough came from the other end of the room. His eyes cracked open. Who was in his nest? Pages didn't cough and must have been someone else. Sorry to intrude, it's me. At the far end of the nest, a shimmering outline stood. The round repeat moved closer, making his way throughout the piles of books littering the nest. Ah, uh, Alan, eh? what are you doing here? He suppressed his frustration. Sleep would also have to wait. I thought you should see something before the stone. Well, take a look. She removed the stone from her pocket, enveloping his surroundings in an orange glow. The sigil on the top looked as if it had been engraved in gold. It's almost time. The rounder P looked down at her and contemplated. Her body was no longer a mass of fluctuating energy. She looked stable, like she was in control. No bracelet. Glad you noticed. But no, after the ritual, I don't use it so much anymore. Anyways, I was sure you wouldn't appreciate an invisible intruder. She was probably right. How long has it been like this? Every day it glows a little brighter. I've considered using it as a night lamp. I wouldn't recommend that. That's what I thought you'd say. Did you say goodbye to them? The IEA? The Grand Archivist asked. Yes, no, I don't know. Some of them noticed I looked different even with the bracelet on. I didn't tell the others it would worry them. Otherwise, I didn't tell anyone. No family to tell. I know how that works. The IEA is like a family to me. That's not what I'm worried about. And the library is to me. He gestured to a small pile of books, conveniently the height of a seat. Please. Thanks. She sat and looked past him at the far wall. You know, this past month I've been trying to figure out how to live my life. Look at me, trying to figure things out. I'm old enough. She laughed, but the pain was evident. I don't know whether to expect death or to continue living normally. Though, I guess it's too late to worry about that. He hesitated and then spoke. I know this may be the last thing you want, but I know a spell to speed things up. What do you mean? I can artificially weaken the link, and perhaps you can escape this limbo you're stuck in. She raised her eyebrows. Or I could die, just saying. I have faith. I know, I do too. It's a hard decision. Alan breathed in, her colors swirling like a cloud of gas. Let's do it. I can't wait anymore. You're sure? Yes. Then pass the stone over. She stood up and handed the stone to one of his lower arms, which made its way up the ladder of hands. He closed his eyes, the runes on his pincers glowing. Six front hands moved to clasp the stone, each causing it to glow ever brighter. Good luck, she said, but he was already in a trance. The room was suddenly filled with a fiery hue. The Grand Archivist held the fire within his hands, a bubbling, raging mass of red energy. She watched as the flame grew and grew, spitting sparks through the air. They swiveled and turned, but dissipated before reaching any of the books. The stone itself was now imperceptible. Alan couldn't feel the sensation any longer, but she knew what the stone did. The link was breaking. She knew the chances were nothing more than a coin flip, yet even so, it felt infinitely more important. It was time. Inside herself, she felt a warmth growing. Her belief, her hope, was manifest within her body, creating an ever-changing glow that refused to die. She was the calm within the storm. In the heat, a single ember floated down towards her face. She closed her eyes and breathed. A Series of Cats by Bunton The light brown tabby with the white spots always loved you. Never, not once in her life, did she ever stop loving you. It's not too unreasonable to think that you were the central figure of her existence. When her mother and all her siblings disappeared suddenly from the world and were never seen again, there you were. You attended to her needs, you validated her existence. For the three years she lived, she loved you as a god. She thought only of you, the little human who looked after her, constantly. And when that truck hit her, she was still thinking of you. 
To the cross-eyed Siamese, you were simply a parent. She cared about you in her way, as you allowed her to live through your continual provision of food and water. But she had some personal autonomy. She had dreams and fantasies of running free in a forest of ferns and chasing giant mice. She had never seen a tree. Oh, and how she would look out into the streets of rock and people and giant metal monsters and fantasize of freedom. Such images of strength and liberty were the only things on her mind throughout that week leading up to exams time. Wasn't that week so busy and so very hectic? It wasn't your fault you had to devote all your attention to it. The thought helped you cope after you opened the basement door a month later. The odd-eyed ginger long hair was different. That's what you always wanted to believe. You had your own flat now, you were responsible. He won't end up the same as the others, that's what you said to yourself. You wouldn't give him too much attention, because that's surely what went wrong with the first two. You fussed over both of them, and then they died. Cause and effect. Obvious, when you think about it. So, you fed him and looked after him without ever really allowing yourself to grow attached. Soon, he became just a needy living fixture that you coexisted with until you dropped him out. He was just a pet. That's all he was. You stood by and watched when the dog killed him, but you were sad about it. The light-coated Balinese felt very little at all. He lived and he meandered. He survived and was content with that. Sometimes he would go out into the street, as your house was so very confined, and the furniture did always have that rough, scratchy quality, and meet the other cats. He hissed, he played, he mated, and he did whatever else cats do when no one else is watching, which is, most likely to say, more hissing and mating. One thing he definitely remembered feeling was confused. He was confused when his human carer appeared one afternoon, in some distress, smelling of anger and disappointment. He was even more baffled when you started producing a lot of noise, as his instincts, with the knowledge that you were female, told him you were either heavily injured or fornicating. And he was simply bewildered when you started kicking him. In fact, his last thought was an attempt to reconcile why someone either hurt or having sex would kick so very, very hard. The beige tabby with the white flecks hated you. She hated every single aspect of your being, from your torn, wrinkled skin, to the way you rarely ever moved, to your smell. Oh, that smell. It was a combination of decay and memory that marked you instantly as an enemy. It described everything one needed to know about you. But she was small and weak, so she just waited in that tiny, neglected apartment. She paced around and sat on your lap when it was necessary to placate you. You were so very needy, always having to be fed and watered. Perhaps what bothered her the most was the smells of escapism. That odor that seemed to her to be of nostalgic fantasies about younger days and how things could have gone. But those days had gone. So she waited and plotted. And when you died, she ate you. And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just pick a direction and start walking. Until then... Good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.